All right, that was short and sweet, but um, we, we got a lot going on here. I uh, appreciate your patience with that. I got Aaron with me. Aaron, um, there was a huge busy news day yesterday. Molly Tibbetts uh, said we covered it here in the Law and Crime Network extensively. Um, unfortunately, I was doing other media appearances and wasn't able to keep up with this case. I know you have. Can you give our viewers a breakdown of what's going on and what to expect today? Okay, we are planning in just a matter of moments to cover the first official court appearance of the accused murderer of that Iowa college student, Molly Tibbetts, of course, her disappearance attracted nationwide attention. People trying to figure out just what happened to her. She was staying over. Okay, she's in this small town in Iowa. She's a, an hour plus away from the Des Moines area, the big city in the middle of the state. Okay, and we're taking, uh, uh, I, I think, a, uh, a look into the courtroom there, um, even though it, it's... Uh, so, so this apparently is the Molly Tibbetts courtroom that we're looking into, and we're waiting uh, for that accused killer to make a first appearance. The defendant's name here, Christian Rivera, okay, he's facing first-degree murder charges related to the disappearance. The bottom line, prosecutors in Iowa say they wound up zeroing in on this defendant by looking at what we see in many cases here at Law and Crime, and that's the surveillance camera footage from houses in the area. They saw a vehicle, okay, Going back and forth around the time that she's believed to have disappeared, they figured out who owned that type of vehicle, apparently, narrowed in on this particular suspect. They questioned him the day before yesterday, and he then started to make admissions according to the officer's affidavit that's attached to the arrest warrant. He remembered circling around, following Molly Tibbetts with his vehicle, getting out of his vehicle, and then running after her and then alongside her. She grabbed her phone, said she was going to call police, and from there the defendant basically says he blacked out. Mm -hmm. Can't remember anything. The next thing he remembers, he's driving along with uh, an earpiece in his lap, Okay, and that apparently triggers his memory that he actually had her in the trunk. Oh my God. So he goes out to this farm field outside town, drops her off, throws her over her, his shoulder, as I understand oh. it, carries her about 30 meters, and buries her under corn stalks or corn leaves. That's where he left her. He basically admitted all this to the authorities, according to the officer's affidavit that's attached to the arrest warrant. So he didn't really say much about an actual attack about an actual murder, but he certainly remembers the before, according to the affidavit, and he certainly remembers the after. So he just leaves her there. Apparently this was an area that they had tried to search, but she was so covered up by whatever was in the vicinity that they didn't find her on uh, an initial uh, look around. So we're, we're uh, waiting for that appearance to pick up any moment in Iowa. And uh, as soon as it gets going, we are uh, we're going to take you there live. Well, that's a great recitation, Aaron. Let me just ask you: Did did this uh, individual know her? Was there any any idea that there's a previous stalking relationship, or it was just a random occurrence? Do we know it, yet? It seems to be random based on what we know right now. But of course, we probably only know a very small sliver of exactly what was going on here. We know that the defendant is an undocumented immigrant. That made uh, a lot of news yesterday. He was uh, working for uh, a farm establishment. Uh, he had been there at least four years, maybe seven years in the country. Uh, there was like a four to seven year window as far as how long this defendant uh, had uh, had been, at least in the U.S. Okay, listen, we're going to go to a break. Thank you, Aaron. I'm glad that you're here to break this horrible case down. Can't get any worse than this. And we'll be back on the Law and Crime Network with more Law and Crime and Aaron. Thank you. Wow, Aaron, so there you go. Um, this was... Uh, you know, extraordinary hearing on, on a couple of levels. On my, uh, from my viewpoint so far, was to scan the a scan court proceeding. Uh, but give us a breakdown so our audience who may just be catching on as a little background about what this case is about. With that gentleman we just saw walking out of the courtroom, the defendant is accused of doing. So bottom line, look, he's facing first-degree murder charges, the top charge in the state of Iowa, with a possibility of life in prison without parole if he's convicted for the death of this young college student, Molly Tibbetts. He basically led investigators straight to that victim's body, or what's believed to be that victim's body. The authorities are holding off on making an official identification pending an autopsy and whatnot, but the bottom line is they're 99.999% they're sure that it's her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that's where we are. Uh, other than that, of course, we, we had this media element to the hearing. That's yeah. what made it a little bit different. The judge turned around and said, First Amendment, you can be here. Right, right. You cover this. 
this is going out in front of the public. The public is going to watch justice roll out in this case. That's the beauty, and, and the beauty of, of the democracy. We were just we were just talking about this issue just before this proceeding. The judge did. said exactly what I said. So bottom line here, you know, um, this is how it rolls out in states that, that, that say, look, the First Amendment says the press can be public. The current incarnation of technology is that we have cameras. They're unobtrusive. They're small. Transmitter boxes are small. We can carry these mm -hmm. things with a camera live and still afford a defendant a chance at a fair trial, which I would hope, despite the seriousness of the charges here, uh, the public hatred that's bubbling up, which the defense ref reference here, uh, I would hope that everybody wants to see a fair trial here. Yeah, and, and there was she a poster of the, the missing girl from July 18th. It's such a, a sad thing, and like you said, it's a waiting confirmation, but um, all indications are pointed that way. Certainly probable cause has been found uh, to have these proceedings. I, I found the dynamic in the courtroom odd. Now, there's a lot of people in the chat room, and a lot of people have been talking about this case. This is mom and dad. Was he married? He had a, Was that the kid, his, his child, uh, that you saw in those shots behind him? It could be. I mean, you know, I'm not there locally to see exactly who these folks are, but, the, but you know, look, we did hear one nugget from the defense, and the defense said he was brought to this country as a child. That, that's what they said. So uh, I picked up on that, and that's on the record in this case. So, so it sounds like he likely came here with other family members, and, and those may have been his family members looking on in this proceeding. They, they looked uh, horribly emotional. Yeah, um, and from the information that I'm gathering is that they're they're not a bad family, decent people. They're very upset, uh, and they're probably in shock, too. There's always uh, people that lose on both sides. Of these. It would not be a surprise. Yeah. Hey, listen, Aaron, thanks so much. Uh, you're at the Law and Crime Network, guys. We're covering so many different things with Roy Oliver and, and uh, the Huber's case that Aaron was out there in Kentucky for. And uh, we're going to be coming back on the other end of the break uh, with more analysis from Aaron and covering this whole bunch of stuff. Thanks for sticking with us, Law and Crime Network. We'll be right back. Wow, me, me and Aaron are like a couple of ping pong balls going back and forth with all the stuff here, Aaron. So, hey, listen, guys, Shania Hoover's is on the stand. Um, we're going to get you the cutting edge stuff with regard to that. To me, this is a partial game changer because she did not take the stand in her first trial. Although um, a skilled cross-examiner, I think, is going to beat her up, if for nothing else, than to bring out all the other facts the prosecutor brought out during the case, regardless of what her answers are. But I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and as far as Roy Oliver is concerned, we have Juan uh, Carranza. He's the lead investigator in the case. He's on the stand right now. We just got done with Molly Tibbetts uh, at the bail hearing there. So let's go into court and listen to what this lead investigator in the Roy Oliver case where a police officer on trial for shooting a 15-year-old unarmed passenger in a vehicle. See you on the other end. Well, there you have it. Use of force expert in the Roy Oliver case. I'm here with Aaron Keller. Uh, Aaron, I, I, I've heard lots of use of force experts before on the witness stand. I, I think he got away with a lot of latitude, that uh, a lot of guesswork, a lot of like about how fast your eyes move in either direction. So, I mean, his ultimate opinion that based upon the circumstances, an officer uh, with, um, with uh, his training and experience would not have taken that shot is valid. But did you find some of it kind of like went off into like really speculative territory? Well, I mean, certainly it was. I mean, we're probably going to get a defense expert up there that says the exact opposite thing of what the state's expert said. Look, the state is trying to slow time down. We talked about this yesterday and say, look at the video, folks. Look at the video. Look at it frame by frame here. There was room for him to react in a different way. The defense is going to say, no, 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 look at that video full it, it, it full blast the way the event happened. It happened a split second. He had to make a decision. In hindsight, it might not have been the best one, but in that moment, he made the right decision. That's what the defense is sure to say. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not sure whether or not this use of force expert is necessarily answering the ultimate question legally that they'll be asked. It doesn't have to be, would you have made that shot or were somebody similar training? It's whether it's within the parameters, even if it went sideways, if it went wrong. The bottom line is, was he in fear of his life or the other officer's life, and was it reasonable? In the end. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I mean, he said that, that the officer shouldn't have taken the shot this way. And I think a lot of people are going to look at it, though, and say, look, he shouldn't have. I mean, what was going on here? It's not like this car was barreling down the street, you know, blowing through barricades. People are jumping left and right. The car was slowly moving, and there appeared to have been no one in the direct path of the vehicle. Okay, this thing started from a parked position. 
It, right. it, it's not the sort of thing that we see in the movies where cars are, are blasting through, you know, vehicles and, and, and everyone's jumping for their lives. Okay, guys. Hey, listen, thank you so much for staying with me today. Aaron's going to be jumping from the guest seat into the host seat. Little Crime Network. I'll be back next week. We're going to break. We'll be right back.